Good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak with you today. I'm Osa Persson, Research Director at Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, day zero, what a great name. I wish every day was a day zero. Uh, starting afresh, lots of energy, everything is possible. Uh, I hope this will be the spirit of the conference. But as you know, in terms of the Sustainable Development Goals, um, we are rather running out of time. Uh, we are on a countdown to 2030, only nine years left, and we're really working on overtime. So in this talk today, I wanted to share with you a global outlook on the SDGs in the context of the current crisis we're in, and more specifically, how do we exit this crisis? Uh, of course, we could talk about the climate crisis, the ecological crisis, the multiple crises we're in. But I wanted to use the economic crisis as an entry point to our discussion and also see what lessons from the past might be applicable for making progress on sustainable development more broadly. So, as you know, we started out last year hearing from the UN uh, a proclamation that we were entering the decade of action, only to shortly after that face a global pandemic that has so far claimed more than 2 million lives. Uh, so I wanted to raise some questions today on the need for structural reform that this crisis has led bare. How do we move from recovery to structural reform that will really help us make progress on this decade of action? So let's start with a quick recap where we are now, uh, one year into the pandemic. I think one of the first images that helped us understand the implications of this minuscule virus um, on sustainable development were these images of how air pollution was temporarily decreased, in this case, northeastern China. But of course, we did not expect these effects to be uh, permanent and not a sustainable development. Shortly after, uh, we were starting to see the implications on the economy, on trade, supply chains, employment, and it became officially labeled as an economic crisis, attracting the attention of uh, G20 political leaders. And you could also say that we started to have concerns that we were entering on the crisis of multilateralism. Would we have international cooperation to take us out of the crisis or not? Later in the year, we saw even wider ripple effects uh, of this virus. Uh, it was not just a struggling airline industry, but really looking at an increase in extreme poverty up to 9% of the global population. This hasn't been seen in many years, not even during the last financial crisis. Also a hunger crisis, uh, some 15% increase in the number of people who are undernourished. Uh, as mentioned, we saw some effects on, on uh, pollution, in this case, carbon dioxide emission. But again, it became clear that these were only temporary and we saw this bouncing back as lockdowns were uh, temporarily suspended. So it became quite clear that there would be negative impacts on many SDGs from the pandemic, both in terms of slipping backwards on poverty, hunger, but also slowing progress in general on things like uh, decent jobs, on things like inequality. Some have estimated we might not be in a position to reach the SDGs uh, globally until 28 to 50 years after the timetable. But uh, interestingly, what the IMF now projects is that um, this will not be a particularly long-term economic crisis. There will be a rebound effect uh, this year, next year, uh, where we will perhaps come back to those uh, pre-pandemic growth levels. And this, of course, raises the, the key question, will this growth be environmentally and socially sustainable? Um, and how do we catch up with the SDGs and also accelerate progress? Of course, also, you can ask, is growth as measured through GDP even the relevant metric to uh, really assess whether we are building back better? So in this talk, I wanted to, uh, together with you, look at a few historical examples of economic crisis and how we have exited them in the past. And using that uh, as the basis, identifying some systemic issues holding SDG progress back and what structural reforms are needed. Uh, in particular, I will propose that we are facing two such systemic issues, inequality and uh, 
the recognition of nature. I'll mention towards the end some promising trends that might help us enable structural reform and then uh, offer some conclusions. So a very quick history lesson. Uh, this is really a whirlwind tour, but I wanted to share with you three examples and try to identify what we can learn, uh, what are the lessons. First of all, um, a really great example is the US Great Depression, um, where unemployment rose to 25%, industrial output halved in the early 1930s, and against this backdrop, President Franklin D. Roosevelt introduced a new deal. This is interesting because it introduced this idea of three phases in the, in the uh, recovery. First, the immediate uh, emergency relief. So these were cash grants to poor, uh, support to farmers, but also quickly creating jobs, for example, in nature conservation, um, etc. And this was then followed by recovery programs uh, where the government sort of worked with industry by industry to regulate wages and prices and also invested more in, in sort of more medium term uh, job creation programs. However, uh, it also beca became clear that they needed to uh, introduce some structural reforms, uh, primarily in the form of labor uh, rights, regulating minimum wage, uh, maximum working time, the right to unionize. So uh, that was a very sh brief summary, uh, but what we can learn here is that recovery is not enough to exit a crisis. In order to prevent it from reoccurring, you need these structural reforms, changing the rules of the game. Also interesting to see that the role of government is changeable. So what was previously quite unthinkable in the US context in terms of the size and the scope of the federal government uh, became uh, acceptable. So the role of government is not necessarily fixed. Uh, of course, they relied on Keynesian economics, uh, big fiscal stimulus packages. And this uh, we have seen in, in, in crisis since then, uh, this search for multiplier effects. How can you create jobs that will also uh, increase consumption at large in the economy and perhaps also adding other uh, societal goals like nature conservation? Also, this example shows the importance of managing expectations. So the signaling effect of these fiscal stimulus, it can be also very important in terms of changing the, the mindset of people uh, in terms of the beliefs in the future. Second crisis, the oil crisis in the 70s. So these were uh, two crises, first in 1973 and then 1979. Also very complex political story. Um, these were indeed politically motivated. But basically, the effect was a uh, embargo or a severe restriction in the supply of oil uh, on the global markets. And this was a crisis for uh, Western European countries and the US who were import dependent on oil. Uh, the responses here, you can also see some immediate responses in terms of rationing uh, gas, for example, in this case but also some more medium term uh, recovery responses, uh, investments in uh, energy efficiency uh, in housing, but also in the uh, smaller cars, more fuel efficient cars, uh, and also alternative energy. And um, countries went for different options here. Brazil invested in ethanol, the UK, natural gas, Sweden and France in nuclear. So why I think uh, this example is interesting is that during this period, we actually see the highest decarbonization rates ever in history. Um, Sweden is, is the example of the, the highest decarbonization rate due to the sort of large scale state led structural change in the energy system. So rather than tinkering at edges, um, a major pro nuclear energy program was launched. I'm not saying that this was the uh, nuclear is the right option here, but it's rather making the point that uh, only this uh, sort of uh, real fundamental structural change in how energy is produced uh, led to some lasting results in this case. Also interesting to note that geopolitics and the security of supply of critical natural resources is a, is a really important driver for countries' uh, policy choices. Third and final example, the global financial crisis in uh, a bit more than 10 years ago. Also a complex story behind this, I won't dwell on it, but it started as a 
crisis in the financial sector that then had effects on the real economy. What I think is interesting about this example is that already from the start, uh, green recovery was presented as an option. So what can we learn from this? Well, so there were some good intentions here um, in terms of the green recovery. But really, we did see a return to business as usual over the longer term, as you can see on this diagram. Um, around 16% of, of the total government spending was uh, classified as green uh, in evaluations of these programs. But it was, uh, they were quite narrowly framed on um, renewable energy and energy efficiency in particular, not really taking into account wider sustainable development goals. So in the post-mortem of this crisis um, and the analysis, um, a key conclusion that comes out is that the government spending on, on green jobs, investments in energy efficiency were not enough, but um, the, the absence of more structural reforms uh, prevented uh, more lasting change, this changing of the rules of the game. So, for example, we didn't see carbon pricing reforms, uh, no phasing out of fossil fuel subsidies at a large scale, and no other regulatory reforms. So, what can we learn uh, for this crisis we're currently in, uh, the pandemic and the associated economic crisis? We have seen some relief measures uh, of different kinds, of course, in the south and the north, uh, where we are currently in, I would say, in the recovery phase. Uh, we are seeing now these government spending programs being rolled out. Um, what we also know is that we are seeing record spending, $12 trillion or more. And it has been uh, estimated that this would more than enough uh, actually cover the transition of the energy system uh, to enable us to meet the Paris climate targets. So the key question is, of course, are governments of the world taking this opportunity? Um, my colleagues are involved in some of the tracking efforts in, in real time to try and assess uh, how these programs are being rolled out. But I think what we can see already now is that there is, again, a strong focus on climate mitigation, uh, renewable energy, renovation of housing to increase energy efficiency, uh, road and rail infrastructure. So, uh, so it's quite a narrow, uh, well, perhaps both design, but also how we study the effects, um, a strong focus on G20 countries. So we don't really know much about recovery in the South where of course a huge part of the economy is uh, the informal sector. Uh, we also don't know much about the uh, sort of broader sustainable development effects beyond climate emissions. How about reform, more structural reform? Are we taking this opportunity to also change the rules of the game? Um, so this leads me on to uh, my proposition that we are indeed uh, now facing two uh, grand challenges, two systemic issues. Perhaps there are more we can uh, discuss that I think uh, uh, on a system level, prevent progress on many SDGs and where we would like to see more structural reform. Inequality first. Um, obviously, this is a, uh, an S SDG, SDG 10, to reduce inequalities. Um, this is, I think, correctly a very multifaceted goal. So it's not just about economic inequality in the sense of incomes, uh, wealth, but also about access, uh, inclusion in decision-making, absence of discrimination, uh, to have a voice. Uh, and uh, we should also say there are big data problems with this goal, but uh, it has been uh, assessed that we are lagging behind on, on uh, reaching SDG 10. Also, interestingly, it's the goal that is least mentioned in the voluntary national reviews. Um, you will have seen graphs like this that show how income inequality is uh, increasing globally, not in all countries, but there have been uh, major shifts also in, in uh, Scandinavian countries like Norway and Sweden, um, which is of course a problem in itself. But what I wanted to uh, lift here is, is again this uh, 
issue of inequality as a systemic issue. So what we have seen in our research is that it's um, uh, any measure to progress on any SDGs will almost certainly have distributional effects. And typically it's these effects that make measures controversial or uh, delayed. So it's really critical to uh, tackle distribution head on to, to make this rapid progress we need to make. Inequality is also a driver, a causal driver of uh, uh, environmental pressures. And uh, this is a really interesting research field. It has developed a lot in the last decade. But as a very quick summary, we can see that uh, both the very rich and the very poor uh, often have the more environmentally harmful uh, consumption patterns. And, and of course, really important equity dimension here. Of course, the rich have a greater responsibility to, to change their consumption. Uh, but also a more kind of indirect causal pathway in that inequality reduces social trust, social cohesion, which can then, uh, which is associated uh, on a sort of uh, macro scale with lower environmental sustainability. And uh, finally, uh, COVID-19 has been referred to as the inequality virus. And we are, of course, concerned that these, um, it will sort of make more permanent uh, some inequalities and that uh, poorer, more vulnerable groups are being more uh, disproportionately more affected by uh, unemployment, for example. So what can we do about this? Um, well, there are many options for structural reform. I would say the toolbox is already there. Uh, it's just about implementation and making bold decision to have clear uh, plans also around redistribution of income and wealth in order to, to uh, make progress on sustainable development. So I just show you here a, a toolbox um, presented by researchers at Harvard, and you'll see it includes things like uh, education, minimum wage policies, uh, big job creation programs, social safety nets, but also things addressing the, the top earners like wealth taxes. Of course, we also need to think about uh, inequality between countries, although this is actually becoming less of a problem compared to inequality within countries. And also here that there are options to, to address um, uh, and, and make these structural reforms. Moving quickly on to the second systemic issue here, uh, the recognition of nature. Again, if we first start looking at the SDGs as individual goals, we know that we are doing uh, less well, we're doing bad uh, on the nature-related SDGs, number 12, 13, 14, 15. But again, here we are interested in how it's a systemic issue for all, and I think there is Again, more and more interesting research from IPES and, and, and other places that nature, ecosystem health, biodiversity has a crucial role for many of the SDGs. Uh, pollination to secure agricultural production, um, uh, to promote medicines and health, uh, etc. But I think there's also a more kind of fundamental uh, worldview issue here. And it was mentioned in the introduction also the planetary boundaries framework which i uh, helped develop this is was a very exciting project in many ways um, seen as very novel but i would argue that it's really just one step in this clear line of uh, ideas uh, starting with the idea of strong sustainability that the economy and society are indeed dependent on nature what the planetary boundaries framework did was to uh, quantify these limits that we must not transgress in order to uh, still have viable societies and economies uh, and a thriving nature. And this has since been also translated to the SDG framework. Um, so this is a sort of intellectual journey for, for many years, too many uh, years, too long time, absolutely. But I think we are also getting closer to a tipping point here. Uh, the solution starts with understanding and accepting a simple truth. Our economies are embedded within nature, not external to it. This quote is from a major report released last week, The Eco Economics of Biodiversity, commissioned by the UK 
uh, Treasury and Ministry for Finance. Um, I mean, this also sort of builds, make an even stronger case, builds momentum to make uh, structural reforms that sort of recognize nature. And I think very interesting debates now on whether we should continue to sort of economically value nature, try to put a price on it, monetize it, or whether it's more about respecting nature, the intrinsic values of nature, protect it, uh, use more regulator tools, uh, or even go uh, so far as to giving nature rights. Uh, we have seen some interesting examples in New Zealand, for example, where uh, a river has been given uh, a legal right. This report also uh, provides many tools uh, and options for the structural reform. We don't have time now to dive into all of them. Um, but basically, these range from uh, more protected areas, investment in nature-based solutions, payment for ecosystem services, to new measures for, um, uh, for economic success, uh, like inclusive wealth, uh, accounting for natural capital, but also more systemic uh, issues, for example, how the finance sector operates, uh, what kind of global standards we apply. And there we go. So, two systemic issues uh, and structural reforms. Uh, these are, of course, big ideas, uh, but I think there are some uh, potentially enabling uh, factors now, some trends that we should look at. Firstly, um, increasing public support. I've been surprised that to see the public opinion polls uh, in the last year during the pandemic, that where people really value uh, uh, sort of uh, the, the, uh, the transition towards sustainable development, whether it's climate, a Green New Deal, or, or nature more broadly. And I just want to show you one uh, figure here uh, showing in a number of countries strong support for a Green New Deal on the left-hand side, uh, a universal basic income, a bit less support that relates to our uh, discussion on inequality, of course, mo most support on uh, the need to create good jobs. Uh, so I'll come back to why jobs is a critical uh, factor in this discussion. Um, also, as I mentioned, interest in these alternative measures to GDP. Again, a very uh, old discussion, but is now getting new energy. For example, the U UNDP Human Development Index was adjusted uh, this year to account for the environmental footprints of countries. Finally, lots of changes in the finance sector, both in terms of the amount of capital now being available for sustainability investments. So it's really just about channeling, allocating them and making sure they go to the most uh, vulnerable uh, and needy places. But also holding the finance sector accountable for living up to standards and policies. And quickly then, conclusions. I hope I showed with these examples that now, uh, the stage we're at now in this pandemic, it's not just the time to pursue recovery, but also really seriously pursue structural reform. And I propose that inequality in nature are two systemic issues that need this, uh, this kind of structural reform. I would like to make a point here though, that I think inequality uh, is not just an end, uh, a goal in itself, but really, what we could see uh, in this research is that it's a means to make progress on other SDGs. So that could perhaps reduce a little bit the political charging around inequality. It's not just the sort of um, ideology or norms relating to redis redistribution in societies, but it's also a concrete tool and means. Nature, I would say, uh, we have seen as a means for economic progress. Uh, we are talking about uh, internalizing uh, externalities, putting a price on nature, but I think we're now seeing a trend and sort of discourse around recognizing intrinsic values, nature for its own sake. Finally, to make this structural reform happen in the short term, I think there are two key sort of uh, concepts, if you like, policy agendas to connect to, to have this traction. One, uh, job creation. What are the good green jobs of the future? Uh, and also how can we use jobs as an economic indicator uh, in addition to GDP? Um, it's not just about reducing 
current unemployment, but also responding to the calls from, from uh, younger generations to have meaningful jobs, uh, achieving uh, the SDGs, um, and also considering how uh, the future of jobs agenda will develop in terms of uh, new technologies like artificial intelligence, etc. How do we make, how can we create meaningful jobs? Secondly, to connect to the circular economy, which I see is also rising on the agenda, both in, in the private sector and in government. Uh, we've had major progress now on, on uh, companies and uh, countries setting net zero climate targets. So the question is, can we build on that and broaden it? So we also see targets and commitments to limit resource use, introduce principles for circularity, new business models. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention and really look forward to the discussion.